Thanks for joining us today. With this lesson, we'll, we are going to begin a series on believers in faith. Today's lesson is going to be a character study of two different types of believers. Each set of believers come from different times. The first one lived during the early kingdom times, about a thousand years before Christ. And then the other two lived with Jesus. Now what we're going to do is we're going to consider a type of believer that for our purposes we'll call compliant. Now you're not going to find compliant in the Bible. But for our definitions today, compliance, compliant folks, compliant believers would be folks who would say that they believe in God. They probably go to worship from time to time, maybe do some good works for others. But they do it mainly because they agree with what God says. Notice the order. They agree with what God says, therefore they believe. Now, when they don't agree, that creates a problem. It creates a problem and it's another matter altogether. They would still say they believe, except when they disagree with what God says, we'll find their character and their actions don't follow. The other type of believer that we're going to look at today is one that we'll call committed. Now, committed folks obviously believe in God, but these are folks who follow the Lord out of a sincere love and respect for God. They appreciate Him, they love Him, they recognize His boundless love and grace, and they're thankful. They're very thankful, and this type of thankfulness and belief changes them. And they do what they do because they trust in God, in His direction, in what He said, and they follow Him. Now, we've got a problem with these types of believers. When you look at folks who are compliant and committed, there's going to be something interesting here. You can't always tell without the Scriptures. You can't always tell just by looking at them that one is better than the other. Now, spoiler alert, the committed are better than the compliant. But the, and the Scriptures leave no doubt that there is a qualitative difference between the two sets of folks we're going to look at today. The problem continues, though, for us in our application in our day and time because the qualitative difference isn't always easily seen. Perhaps that's the reason why our Lord in His wisdom and through the Spirit tells us constantly in the New Testament to be very careful to not judge from a visual perspective, but to judge with righteous judgment. Because the two groups of people we're going to look at today, one of the folks, it is clear that they, they, they all say they believe in God. They all say they love God. But what's clear from our study today is one from each set really believe in God, and the other ones say they believe in God but really don't. And they're sitting right next to each other. And if you had a spreadsheet of good and bad, and you were checking one box here and one box there, the boxes might be different, or they might not. Compliant and committed is what we're looking at today. Now, our first set of people we're going to look at is in the Old Testament is Saul and David. Saul, we're going to call Saul our compliant believer. From what we're told about Saul in the book of 1 Samuel, God showed Saul great favor. Saul shows up at the end of the time of the judges. Samuel was the last judge of God. And Israel had said that they wanted a king like all the nations around them. They had forfeited their place, and they didn't want the judges. Saul, Samuel wasn't good enough, and honestly, Samuel's sons were pretty bad. Just like Eli's sons before him. So God chose Saul, and he tells Samuel to go choose Saul. Now, where we meet Saul is, is he's looking for his father's donkeys. He's looking for his father's donkeys and he happens upon Saul and Saul tells him that the donkeys have been found but God has a bigger plan for you. Now, he appreciates the blessings and is worried about what his father, what Saul's father is thinking about him 
But Samuel says, you're going to be the leader of Israel. You're going to be the leader. And Saul says, how can that be? I'm, and he was reluctant. He was reluctant for a long time. The first time that we find Saul, he is being a decent leader and he gives a mouth to God in the blessings of God. But when we first see his true character, his unwillingness to change is in 1 Samuel chapter 15, beginning in verse 13. Now Saul has been given a responsibility. He's been given a job to do. He's been given a job to do by God to strike the Amalekites. The people of Amalek have been disobedient and rebellious to God for centuries. And the reason that God sent Israel back in, not only to give them land, but he allowed, he told Abraham, 400 years. He gave them centuries. But in those centuries, they had rejected God in every way, shape, form, or fashion. And part of Israel's responsibility through God was to strike them, to discipline them. And they were told, do not take anything. No spoils of war. So after the Israelites go and there is a victory, Samuel comes to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15, beginning in verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, May the Lord bless you. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. And Samuel said to Saul, Stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. And what we hear from the rest of this time is Samuel goes on to explain to Saul how he had not only failed, but he had rebelled against God. God gave him specific instructions. You see, the problem with Saul was he was fine with the victory as long as God lined up everything like he thought. But when God didn't line up everything like he thought, he thought he was, I've done enough. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And Samuel continues, he continues in verse 22. And Samuel said to them, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, that's witchcraft, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. When we consider what Saul has done here, Saul is showing himself to be compliant with God as long as God fit his ideas. But as soon as God asked him to do something that he didn't agree with, apparently Saul, while still saying, I believe in God, while still saying, I appreciate the blessings of God, does not appreciate them and is not committed to him at all and does what he wants to do. And the sad part of the story is the rest of the book of 1 Samuel tells the story of this decline and the downfall of Saul, and it plays out to the end. It's so bad, he tries to kill David. Saul's list of evils and sin and rebellion. It's just awful. Now, if you know anything about David, David is our next person, and we're going to call him committed. Now, here's the thing. Here's the odd thing. If you were to line up all of Saul's evils and all of Saul's sins and all of David's sins and evils, you would come up with a pretty good reason to say, well, there's really no difference between them. If we know anything at all about David, he has great moments of victory, great moments of faith, great moments of leading, but he also has enormous mistakes. Mistakes that are clearly told to us in Scripture, which, by the way, as an aside, is one of the reasons to understand and believe. Because the last thing anybody wants to share is all of their errors. My cousin Alex, he used to have a plaque in his bedroom and said, what if your errors were told every day just like baseball players? Well, the genius of our God in telling this story of redemption, this unified story, is that he, great people of faith 
what is told to us is they're glaring mistakes. And David has glaring, enormous mistakes. And what Samuel tells Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13, what he tells him about David is, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be leader over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Samuel told Saul, your kingdom is not going to continue, even though God chose you. God's promise to you is not going to continue because you have not kept the covenant. You have not kept up your part. Folks, this is a biblical fact. If we do not keep up our part of the covenant with God, no matter what we proclaim with our mouth, if our character and our actions don't meet it, like Saul, God will say, that's not good enough. Now, what's hard is that David has some of the most glaring problems. But listen to what Paul said about David in Acts chapter 13. He worded it this way about David. When he had removed him, when he had removed Saul, he raised up David to be their king, whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all of my will. Now, we got a problem with all of this. From our earthly perspective, you line up Saul here and you line up Samuel or you line up David over here, you have a list of grievous sins and rebellions against God with both of them. Except the difference is David still believes and is willing to be changed. And there are great moments of faith and many great blessings that David has bestowed upon him. Our problem, if we, if we try to judge the soil, if we try to figure out who's better, we're going to fail. Because our earthly perspective, it's going to be difficult for us to see the difference between a complier and the committed. Saul and David is an excellent, is an excellent run that our judgments need to be held close and tight. Because if you just add them up with Saul and David... Neither one of them are good enough. But that's a foreshadowing of the gospel. Who is good enough? Our next two, our next pair are Judas and Peter. We're going to call Judas as the compliant one and, Dave, and Peter, rather, as the committed one. Judas, like Saul, was a compliant believer. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, Judas is named as one of God's, Jesus' chosen disciples. And right after in Matthew chapter 10, a fascinating thing to think about Judas. Now, see, we know the rest of the story. But what we know about Judas is he was given the Holy Spirit to a degree that he was able to go out and teach and proclaim and heal. The rest of Matthew chapter 10 tells about Jesus sending out his disciples in what is commonly called the limited commission. Like the rest of the 12, he was sent out. He was sent out to proclaim. He was sent out to go do good. And he went and they did good. And many people turned to the Lord, maybe even at Judas preaching. Can you imagine that? Somebody coming to believe in Jesus because Judas did the right thing and said the right things for two years. That's not something we talk about very much. But what we are told later in John chapter 12, after the woman comes in and has a very, very, very expensive ointment, we're told by John that Judas complained. He complained about how expensive it was and how extravagant it was and how many people could have been fed. But really the backdrop that we find out later with 2020 hindsight is that Judas was stealing. Now imagine that, stealing money and then telling everybody to believe in Jesus. Now what we're told in John chapter 18, what we know and the rest of the story taints everything before it, since we're looking at it in history, is when Judas came and betrayed Jesus in the garden in John chapter 18. He came up and he betrayed him with a kiss. Now, what is very interesting to me in reading through the Gospels is none of the disciples had any inkling about Judas whatsoever until everything was over. There was no difference. Judas looked like the rest of the twelve. 
And Peter is an example of someone that we can call committed. Peter is different. He's different and has the highest of highs. In Matthew chapter 16, in verses 16 through 18, Jesus says, And you are Peter. His name before was Simon or Cephas. And he says, And now you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. Can you imagine the highest of highs? Peter is one of the inner circle. Peter, James, and John. The three of the closest of friends and followers of Christ. And he says in Matthew chapter 16, you will be granted the keys of the kingdom. And we see that played out in the book of Acts where Peter not only speaks on Pentecost, but he's also the first of the 12 to actually go to a Gentile and preach the gospel. And he was willing to do it, even though he didn't want to. Peter was committed. And speaking of the highest of highs, in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus takes Peter and James and John with him on top of a great mountain and is transfigured in front of them. And Peter, albeit mistakenly, he is there at one of the heights of Jesus' time when he transfigures in front of them. But while what follows closely thereafter in Matthew chapter 17 is one of his lowest of lows. Matthew tells us that at that time, Jesus began to teach that he had to go to Jerusalem and be betrayed and to be crucified and raised the third day. And Peter takes him aside in Matthew chapter 17, beginning around verse 14, and begins to tell him, no, Lord, this is not what's going to happen. Imagine that. Telling the Lord, you've got it wrong. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God in Matthew chapter 16. You see him transfigured in Matthew chapter 17. And then you take this Christ, the Messiah, the anointed of God, you take him aside and say, you've got it all wrong. He believed. He was committed to the Lord. But yet, here is the lowest of lows. The lowest of lows that Jesus looks at him and says, get behind me, Satan. And then, of course, in John chapter 18, at perhaps one of the lowest moments in Peter's life, on the night that Jesus is betrayed by Judas, G Peter betrays Jesus as well. At three different times. And the Lord told him this earlier in the night. Earlier on that Thursday night before he's crucified, early on Friday morning, earlier that night, Peter and the rest of the twelve, all of them proclaimed their faith. All of them proclaim their commitment. All of them say, if we have to die, we will serve you and follow you. We will not betray you. Earlier that night, Satan had already entered Judas' heart. But after Jesus is betrayed, Peter is outside in the courtyard of the high priest's house and he's warming himself by a charcoal fire. And he betrays the Lord three times. Jesus had told him earlier, before morning, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said, absolutely not, that will not happen. And here is this Peter, here is this man who is committed to the Lord. And he, said, and he finally ends up swearing an oath, cursing. I do not know the man. After earlier he had drawn a sword, after earlier he had proclaimed his commitment and faith. Now you see, if Peter really was in charge of the Bible, do you think that would have made the Bible? The genius of this Holy Spirit that we have, the genius of this God that loves us, is that tells even the warts, even the failings of great people of faith, even people who are committed to him, People like Abraham, people like Isaac and Jacob, people like David, people like Moses, people like Peter. You see, you line up Judas and Peter together, you line up Judas and Peter together on that Thursday night, both of them portray Jesus. But the difference between Judas and Peter is Judas went off and hung himself. And Peter, in his sin, in his betrayal, in his not understanding, doesn't give up and is there on Sunday morning. And later around a charcoal fire, 
tells his Lord three times that he loves him. Peter was committed. Now, one of the things, there, there's so much more that we could say about all of this, but let's consider some of the similarities and differences about these two sets of people between Saul and David and Judas and Peter. First, some of the similarities. Were the committed less sinful than the compliant from a human vantage point? From a human vantage point, is David better than Saul? If we didn't have the Holy Spirit telling us so, we would answer no. They are both obviously sinful people. They have rebelled against God. When David kills a man so that he can cover up his adultery and fornication, that, is, that doesn't look to us like a man after God's own heart. But what that teaches us is that sometimes people after God's own heart makes egregious mistakes. They make egregious mistakes not only like adultery and fornication, perhaps even abortion, perhaps even many things that we find completely detestable. And they are detestable. But the committed sometimes sin just like the compliant. And from a human vantage point, it's hard to tell the difference. What we also can't do is we also can't look at them and say, well, the committed have an easier life. Peter and Judas are in the same spot. Saul and David are in the same spot. They both have similar opportunities and similar temptations. And what did they do with them? The committed did not have an easier life in any way, shape, form, or fashion. They had the same life. And... We've chosen these two sets because of the similarity of the situation, the similarity of the temptation. They didn't have an easier life. But the real difference is, it's seen with the committed. Neither one of them are sinless. David and Peter are not sinless. They are not earning their place into God's favor. They're, neither one of them are wise in their choices. Peter and Judah's choices that night are eerily similar. But the difference about David and Peter when compared to Judas and Saul is that they remain committed to God and when they are called to repent, they will repent. When they are shown their sin, they are willing to repent. And ultimately, they rely on God in faith. They remain committed to God. Peter's character is shown, especially in John chapter 6, when he goes from thousands to teens of followers, thousands who follow him and then are upset by something that Jesus said. Peter doesn't have any idea what Jesus is talking about in the Bread of Life passage of John chapter 6, but he says to the Lord at the end of the chapter, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. And the difference between Peter and Judas is seen in that Peter, even though his failings are enormous, He's willing to wait it out. So from a real life perspective, how do we apply this idea? Well, the, the way that we're going to look at to today is how do we view God and His Word? How do we view what He says? Do we consider that it's an obstacle? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in dealing with a group of Christians and grew in a, with a group of believers who are struggling with practice and faith and what to believe. Paul writes this idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Paul says, it's the same story. Some people reject it because it's foolish, like the Greeks. Some people reject it because we don't do enough miracles and signs. But what's interesting is, Jesus did miracles and signs, and so did the apostles, and the resurrection happened right in front of thousands of people. 
Many witnesses were walking around saying, I saw it. And yet that wasn't enough. Miracles aren't enough. Unfortunately, Jesus even being raised from the dead and saying, I believe for some folks isn't enough. What makes the difference? If we view the preaching of the gospel as an obstacle, if we view God's word as an obstacle, if we refuse to change, to be willing to be changed by the gospel, we might say we believe in God, but we'll only be compliant up to a point. We'll only go so far. We'll only go so far in when we agree with God. And when we disagree, there's another way to look at the Word. There's another way to look at God is a list of rules to obey. Now, many believers in Jesus' day were like this. They looked at God, and He has given them a list of rules. Now, certainly, He gave them a list of rules, but they used these rules as a means of judging other people. I'd like for you to recall and maybe even later read in Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 8, as Jesus and His disciples are walking, they're walking along the way on a Sabbath, and they find a grain field. And as disciples are walking along, they take the grain, they take it in their hands, they husk it, and they put some grain in their mouth for sustenance. They're on the edges of the field. And people who were following by with Jesus found fault. And they said, your disciples are working on the Sabbath. And Jesus upbraided them and looked at them. He says, basically, he says, you're using the rules of God to judge other people and to damn them because they don't act like you. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 27, Jesus makes this statement. He says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. If we walk around today looking at the rules and using them to judge other people, that's not the reason that these rules that we have from God are given. These rules are given us to show us the mind of Christ and we will be committed to them. Not a list of rules to be damning and judging other people because they don't act like you. I'm sad to admit this, but if I saw Jesus and his disciples walking along the road on a Sabbath day doing this, I may very well have been tempted to find fault as well. What about you? How quick are you to find fault with somebody who disagrees with you? How quick are we to find fault with what the Bible says? How we view God and His Word is important. We shouldn't view it as an obstacle because it's a means of our salvation. We shouldn't just view it as a list of rules to obey because there's more to it than that because Saul obeyed God for a while and so did Judas. But does that make them approved of by God? Well, absolutely not. Apparently the way that we ought to look at God and His Word and God's revelation to us, we should look at this whole gospel message as an opportunity to have life and fellowship with God now and even into eternity. The psalmist said in Psalm 122 and verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You see, some folks view Sunday now as, well, you got to go to church. And of course, believers want to worship God. But it's not about a building. Sundays are a day and an opportunity for Christians in various situations and with various struggles to set aside some time to think about the goodness of God. It's not about a specific time. And there are specific times when in most situations... And without the duress of a pandemic, when we can assemble together. But worship doesn't stop because of a pandemic, because Christians can worship and appreciate the life and the fellowship with God in many ways. And to hear the heart, hear the heart of what God says. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, hear what John says. He says, See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that. It did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. 
And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This idea of it's an opportunity to live and to have life and to appreciate and to love God. That's how we ought to view this great gospel that we've been given. That's how we ought to live our lives. As stretching ourselves and challenging ourselves to be fully committed to Him. To fully appreciate God. We need to be the type of believer that has a view of our service to God as an opportunity. As a blessing to serve. As an occasion for rejoicing and thankfulness. Because we get to God, we get to serve a God and to worship a God and have fellowship with a God who loves us and longs for us to be with Him. The links that He has gone to to make a way for us to be saved is the greatest story ever. And it ought to cause thankfulness to exude out of us. Thankfulness that makes us victorious over the sins that we have committed. And not so much look down on others who don't do it just exactly like we do. We need to be the type of believer that has this view. We need to make the ultimate choice to be committed to Him. To be committed to Him and to do whatever He says out of faith. Not to just be compliant, not to just check off a few things that we agree with. But to be fully committed to Him, our Father. To worship, to serve, to act in a way that speaks of following Jesus. Not so that we can be arrogant and congratulate ourselves. But to be humble followers. Recognizing and being transparent about our sins. To fully admit that without the grace of God, none of us are good enough. But in being committed to Him and saying like David, my sin is ever before me causing us to be humble and thankful. And the hard part of all of this is, it may be that the real difference may not be seen till Judgment Day. Now, it will be seen on Judgment Day. But if we were contemporaries of Saul and David, and we saw all those years from the outside looking in, you know probably what we'd say about kings? They're terrible. From the outside looking in for those first three years, even up until Friday, you know what we would say about all of the 12 disciples? They were terrible. They didn't stick with it. But thanks be to God that it's not human valuations and judgment, but it's God looking down on us out of love and grace and calling us to be committed to Him, not just compliant, not just checking a few boxes, not just doing the things that we agree with, but letting God and His Word change us to become victorious, to become, if you'll pardon the expression from a few weeks ago, unsinkable. So that not even persecution, tribulation, not even judgment from family and friends and brothers and sisters cause us to give up on God. Those are truly the committed ones whom God approves. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for your love and kindness. And we pray, our God, that we would allow you to change us. That our thankfulness and our belief would grow into a type of faith that would blossom and it would show, not to congratulate ourselves, but it would show to our family, to our friends, to the people we work with, to our sons and daughters and grandchildren, to our neighbors that we believe and that you are worth believing in, that you are worth being committed to. Help us not to just check off a few boxes and be compliant. Help us to truly believe and help us with our unbelief. Forgive us of our sins and help us to be the type of people who would do whatever you ask us to do. Because, Father, we recognize and proclaim our belief in your Son, 
who did just exactly what you asked him to do, even when it was hard. We pray that your grace and blessings be on us. And Father, help us to have a humble heart of thankfulness to you so that we will be committed to you both now until the end. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today. Please go to our webpage at veilchurchofchrist.org. Go to our YouTube channel. There's a link there that you can join our YouTube channel and you can subscribe so that you are notified whenever new videos like this one are posted. May God bless us all.